Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages, of all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We are unapologetically progressive. Yes. Yes. In welcoming people of all ethnicities and races, nobody is garbage. Amen. Yes. We welcome people of all sexual orientation and gender identities, all social and ec economic situations, all politics, all abilities. We advocate for human rights and we strive to be good stewards of this one earth. In living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. We honor them as we have been asked to do. We take a moment in service to honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. We have learned how precious it is to come together to expand our circle of care and kindness. So if you are new, please help us get to know you. We have name tags, we have ushers, we have room for all the questions. And I invite everybody to stay after service for coffee and conversation in Fellowship Hall if you're with us in person. And if you're online, we have our Zoom room for a little chat there as well. And as we Enter into this moment, let me invite you to turn your devices to worship mode, whether buzzy or silent, as that works for you. I have a few notes for today. This afternoon uh, at 5 o'clock is a discussion of Will and Harper, the next Netflix documentary about the friendship with, uh, between Will Farrell and his friend Harper, who has come out and is debuting in the country as a trans woman. Uh, this is hosted by Tim Harrell, their soup and bread provided, and all are welcome. This coming Wednesday evening, you know, I hear there's something big happening on Tuesday. I hear there's something big happening on Tuesday, and I think we need a little moment to recover from what might happen on Tuesday. Who knows? So on Wednesday at 6.30, we'll have a chance for reflection, for maybe a little decompression, for being together, and for whatever is the moment at that moment. Uh, we'll gather in the sanctuary, but we're also, uh, folks are also welcome to bring some comfort food to share in Fellowship Hall in the course of things. So see me if you'd like to help with that. Next Sunday, November 10th, will be, after service, will be the annual soup lunch, soup fundraiser for Pleasant Valley Middle School. Uh, we provide meals. Uh, we, we send home food for a number of the families from that school, uh, I think, pretty much every week. And it's folks who really need, uh, you know, it's some of our most marginalized folks in this area. And we do what we can. Um, and I want to direct folks to see Bernie. Humphrey for questions about the program. It's really a great thing. It's not just about the food either. There's a lot more that goes on. And I'll say donations are welcome before and after. Even if you can't make it on that particular Sunday, the donations for that event uh, are welcome before or after it as well. Um, you may have seen in our notes uh, from Friday, we have had a, a number of um, deaths that we're mourning in this moment in the congregation. Some of the services have a little more time that they're announced, but one of them in particular is coming up pretty quick. Um, uh, I hope you saw the notices that Shirley Cunningham uh, passed away last Sunday after afternoon. Her memorial is coming up a little sooner than some. Her service will be on Monday, November 11th. 
at 2 p.m. So a week from a week from tomorrow. I just want to make sure to put that in front of people because sometimes it's easy to miss these things. And now, on this Sunday before the election, let us call into love being our guide as we sing our opening hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. It's in the gray hymnal and on the screen. Let me invite Tony Huerta forward for our opening words. A place of belonging and caring from the Reverend Kimberly Ann Tomzak Carlson. It is not by chance you arrived here today. You have been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside of you, there is a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, a desire for a place of belonging and caring. Through your struggles, someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief in a shared purpose, a common yet precious resource, that belongs to all of us when we share. And so you began seeking a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that opens its arms to possibilities of love, a heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. Welcome home. Welcome to worship. And let me invite Bill and Isaac Ordaz forward for our chalice lighting. From the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. Our, we light our chalice this morning in honor of the tiny spark that each of us create when we cast our votes and add our voices to the larger light of liberty. We light this chalice in honor of all first-time voters, all those who are just now old enough to vote, all those who have just become citizens, and all those who have never voted but before but have decided for the first time to participate. We light this chalice in honor of all who have fought for the right to vote, our ancestors and elders who refused to be overlooked and demanded representation. We light this chalice for all of those who have faithfully voted in many elections, each time imagining the world as it might become. And we light this chalice for all those who are not able to vote, 
that we may remember them when we make the choices that will impact us all. May our democracy be strengthened and our choices light the way toward a more beloved world. We set aside this moment for reflection, for centering ourselves in this time, in this community, for all the reasons that bring us together. All are welcome to come forward during our music for meditation, to light a candle. For those who are online, let these candles be for you. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
This is the time for sharing the joys and sorrows of the congregation. Let me begin with offering healing wishes to all who are struggling with health concerns at this time. I know there are so many, so many struggles that show up in so many ways to keep us from work, to keep us from life. We recognize that you are seen if this is a struggle for you. I want to thank the caring committee and everyone who assisted with yesterday's memorial for Irene Dittmars, who was Amy Cordonaway's mother. It was, it was a wonderful thing to celebrate a life with a beautiful family. We offer condolences to the family and friends of Shirley Cunningham. Shirley died last Sunday afternoon after some recent struggles with her health. Her memorial will be here on Monday, November 11th at 2 p.m. Plans are coming together for Heather McMeekin's memorial. It will be on November 16th. Please see me for questions or information. In our larger world, I want to recognize the celebration of Diwali, the Hindu celebration of lights. On this Sunday, before the election, I offer a prayer from my colleague, the Reverend Kristen Graschel Schmidt. Friends, we have gathered this morning for gratitude for all that has brought us to this day, this moment, this breath. Let us never forget that we serve our neighbors, our values, our free faith, and the spirit of the many who have gone before us, who made ways when there was no way, who left legacies for us to remember, to follow, to emulate. As we prepare for the week ahead, let us pray that the fire of commitment, the spirit of truth, love, and justice that was in those ancestors goes with us. God of many names and beyond all naming, spirit of love, breath of life, in this time when the stakes feel so high, help us to remember that no season lasts forever that the days of the greedy and the powerful are numbered. And there is a force at work in our world and among us that lifts up the oppressed, that fills the hungry with good things. In this season of coming cold, may we all remember to stoke the flame of resistance that burns within and among us, a flame that warms and unites us against the forces that lead to inequity and injustice. In this season of growing darkness, help us turn away from the glare of life's distractions so that we might accept the gifts of the darkness. And in the midst of all the work, look up and remember how fearfully and wonderfully we each have been made for we are the very stuff of stars. In the name of all that is good, all that is holy, all that is just and right and true. Amen. Let us share one more moment of quiet together, one more pause in this time. and Let us breathe.
Shalom, Salam, Namaste, and Blessed Be. Let me invite Jesse Lachlan forward for the story. We have a slight change of the story today from the order of worship. As was mentioned before, Tuesday is a big day in this country. And on Tuesday, we ask that everyone who can and hasn't yet shows up to vote. And that is the name of the story by Ani DeFranco. As best as I remember, here is how it went. I learned what it meant to show up and vote. It was a nasty November, windy and raining, and I was complaining about my wet coat. But Mama said, listen. We are on a mission that by definition, no one can do for us. It is a very important job. When we got to the building, we saw our neighbor, Ms. Cook, and she paged through a book. And in that book, we found my mama's name. Mama signed her name again right next to it. It felt like we belonged. Then I discovered that we knew others. I said, it looks like the whole neighborhood's here, and we've all got the same job to do. Mama nodded. She looked impressed. She said, yes, you are catching on. It made me feel proud to be there helping my mom. Then I got excited when we were invited into a booth and the curtain was drawn. It seemed special and secret that no one could see us. I felt kind of nervous, but Mama was calm. She said, here is the part where it all starts, where us people have a say about laws and rules and parks and schools and who's going to run them and in what way. Then she chose the names and I pushed the buttons and each little button lighted a light. We voted for the ones who will get things done, take care of things for everyone, and make things right. And before the last button, Mama paused and said, Imagine all the people doing this same thing. And I imagine them in my mind. And we were connected. On our way out, we got stickers. 
Mama and I. And on our way home, I looked around, and the same things were there, but I saw a lot more. The rain had stopped. The street lights were on. I saw people in windows and walking through doors. I thought about everyone working together, each doing their part and looking out for each other. And how showing up to vote is how it all starts. I wonder what your plan is for Tuesday. The kiddos are invited to join me in religious education. The collective gifts of the congregation make it possible for us to be here today. Those offerings of service and care and money from the past lead in a direct line into our lives, whether this is our first Sunday visiting or we, if we have been here for many, many, many Sundays. We receive those gifts, contribute our own for the sake of the congregation and for that of our children. And what we gather together is then passed forward to the people, well, the people we will never meet. We are setting the pace and the tone for tomorrow. So it is good every time we gather in service, it is good to make an offering. We also send a portion of our gifts out into the world through our Share the Plate program, one half of the undesignated collection. We gather on Sundays for a given month, go out to a local agency to assist with their good work. And for November, this is the first Sunday of the month, we have a new recipient. For November, uh, our recipient is Lula NFP. They are a local outreach team that provides food, temporary shelter, clothing, sleeping bags, blankets, tents, bus passes, and so much more to those who are living on the street or in tent encampments. All the folks that they work with have experienced significant trauma and most experience some form of mental illness as well. This is an essential bit of work for some of our most vulnerable members of our community. They also, Lula also provides assistance with resources, housing, medical care, all of those things that are needed to take care of the basics of life and maybe even do a little bit better than just survive. So our share of the plate program, half of the undesignated plate goes to the church, half to the named agency. Please use the envelopes uh, in the pews and designate the use of your gift or see the QR code in the order of service as well. Make an online donation. I wanna thank everybody for all the gifts that we receive that make our good work possible. And now, I invite the ushers to please come forward.
Our reading is The Promise, the Practice, and the People by E. N. Hill. In this fall season of 2024, we are at a crossroads in history, a moment in time when democracy is not just a word or a system of government, but a living, breathing promise, a covenant we make with one another. This promise of democracy is one of collective power and shared responsibility. Many understand that this covenantal promise is not without its challenges. Democracy asks us to engage in issues, to participate in bringing about change, and to care deeply about one another. It is cultivated in the small, consistent actions in the conversations we have, in the ways we listen and learn from each other, in recognizing the dignity of every person and honoring the rich diversity of our lives. In the words of Vice President Kamala Harris, democracy, our democracy is not guaranteed. It is only as strong as our willingness to fight for it to guard it, to never take it for granted. We the people have the power. You have the power. And when we vote, we expand the power, the possibility, and the promise of democracy. It is clear that the heart of this democracy is the promise of the people, our hopes, and our dreams. We are the democracy and the stewards of this promise, the practitioners of this sacred work. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe democracy is more than a political system. It is a shared journey, a collective responsibility, and a profound act of faith in one another. May we travel this path with grace, with purpose, and with a phenomenal commitment to the common good. So may it be. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn number 155, Circle Round for Freedom. Mm -hmm.
We have passed Halloween and Samhain and Dia de los Muertos and All Souls. So many ways we remember and honor the dead. The liminal time of the next months is upon us, ready or not. But before Thanksgiving, and even before Veterans Day, there is the election. Employees and staff and volunteers in small towns and large cities all across the country have been putting together the forms and the processes that equip us for voting, for each of us to have a say. I always appreciate the volunteers who staff the polling centers in a local school, in a congregation, in a church such as this one will be on Tuesday. They are efficient in their guidance for helping, helping folks through the process. They have a setup of hospitality to last the long, long hours of the day. People have been working for some days and weeks and months ahead of time to enable our opportunity for early voting as well. Now, my spouse and I took our children to the election commission here in Peoria about a week ago. It was well managed and there was a constant stream of voters. What also happened was there was an older gentleman who clearly was having some difficulty with walking, and he came into the end of the line. Another voter in line, a woman who recognized him, called him up to the front, simply made, cleared the way and called him up to the front of the line, and everyone made way for him. We all sh shuffled over to the side so he could go to the front. And we were happy to make it as easy as possible for him to fulfill his purpose, as were the election staff. I am so grateful to everyone who is committed to this essential task. And at the same time, this is one of the most fraught moments in our national experience. I am struck so by the current conflict in our government, in our local politics between neighbors, and the deeply disturbing behavior and agendas of certain candidates and leaders, certain people who would have the world in their image and no room for anybody else. What people do with democracy can be a far cry from what many of us think about it and would wish to have happen. So I thought about democracy for a bit in this moment. It would be no surprise that some of the first quotes I found speak to some ambivalence at best about the whole idea that anyone should have a vote. From Winston Churchill. It has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except all the others that have been tried. <laughs> From Thomas Jefferson, democracy, a democracy is no more than mob rule where 51% of the people may take away the rights of the other 49. That gives you a little pause, eh? Remember, one thing about democracy, Edward Albee says, we can have everything we want at the same time, always end up with exactly what we deserve. Hmm. Ooh. From William Grider, Americans cannot teach democracy to the world until they restore their own. And yet, and yet we seem to like this. Hmm. Democracy is, in fact, at the core. Democratic processes, our understanding of everybody having a voice and a vote, 
is at the core of the founding of this country, both in governance and in faith. From Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Rebecca Parker. Our Puritan forebears resisted oppression by putting into practice a way of life that manifested an alternative to the structures of oppression that dominated their lives. This was the heart of their covenant, to be what they wanted to see, to live as if justice had arrived. They organized their church life to include the free conscience of each individual in a mutual commitment to the common good. They manifested an alternative to the oppressive use of power by a small elite, uninterested in the welfare of all, exercising economic and religious power without consent or accountability. As matters evolved, what the Puritans first practiced in their congregations transformed nations. Puritan scholar A.S.P. Woodhouse offers, the congregation was the school of democracy. There, the humblest member might hear and join in the debate, which might witness the discovery of the natural leader and participate in the curious process by which there emerges from the clash of many minds a vision clearer and a determination wiser than any single mind could achieve. Now, I do recognize that part of what the Puritans were trying to create was a theocracy with the city on the hill. Let us do, you know, let us acknowledge this. But somehow they did this radical thing in the process of allowing people the chance to think and engage and discover. And from these origins, democracy, which is one of the essential elements in Unitarian Universalism, of which we are direct, uh, direct descendants of the Puritan people who first came to this land. We believe in the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society. This is a core part of the shared values among us. We understand that every person has a voice, that every person has worth, that every person is a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, that we are each affirmed in our place and presence in the world, and that each of us has agency and a right to choose. We have a right to choose how we are. We have a right to choose how the community will gather, whether as two or three, in the name of all that we do with our congregations, or in the decisions of the highest elections of the land, in the separate spheres of church and state, all people have a say. And the practice of this in this age is a struggle with so many efforts to curtail and cut off people from voting, to dehumanize millions of people in the country and say they should be kicked out to set the tone for violence and to set up a false strongman as a savior. Oh, the democracy practice is a little tough right now. I want to offer a note that one might wonder as some of the conversations have about the separation of church and state. The separation of church and state, going back to the founding of the country, was in part so that the state would not interfere with belief, with individual belief. It was only in about 70 years ago under Lyndon Johnson, who didn't like some people mobilizing against him, that he put this kind of restriction on uh, whether nonprofits and churches could say something politically from the pulpit, if you will. 
but we can always, in fact, it would be impossible to separate our values from our public presence. We can always speak to policy. We can always speak to our principles. We can always speak to our humanity and our neighbors and our earth. We are, in fact, called to do so. So there's plenty to say in the church, if you will. And we should. But the challenge in this moment is about how do we live in this democratic way of life? My colleague and street minister, the Reverend Kurt Kuwald, says, to enter into a truly democratic way of life, we need to be clear that in these times, to live democratically is to live a fugitive life. We cannot adjust to this society and live wholesomely. To find true health, true authenticity, we must live against the grain of our times because these are the times of advancing empire. We must live in the border communities of society as well in the border territories of the selves that empire has demanded of us, has forced us to conform to. Dr. King made it very clear there are some things to which we must be maladjusted. Inequity, hate, violence, separation, domination, torture, and war. He goes on, we have been overwhelmed. We have been forced to give ourselves up. We have been driven from the garden of our innocence and simple honesty. We are at some tier, some level near our core. We have had to cut ourselves off from ourselves and, of course, from others. Our siblings, our brothers, our sisters, our lovers, our children, and our dear, dear friends. even as we have been so, the structurally so encouraged to be so isolated from one another and from ourselves and not have faith that we can come together, here we are. We persevere. And our ancestors before us have persevered as well. We receive that benefit from them. They, we are here because they held on. In small ways, perseverance happened every time a black man tried to vote before 1870, every time a woman tried to vote before 1920. In all the small ways, people keep remaining maladjusted. In all the ways, you and I find ourselves against the grain, even if it is for a modest wish to our government to endorse our rights to life and liberty. In this moment, the current concern has reached a fever pitch of teetering on the edge of fascism. The separation has been so deep that we are at the edge of fascism, a controlling, dominating effort that has been in active development for the last 40 years. My colleague, the Reverend Scott Alexander, lays out what is at stake in this moment. Preservation of our precious American democratic processes, norms, and institutions. Protecting the, national, the natural environment here in the United States and seriously addressing the wider threat of global climate change. Of guaranteeing women's rights for reproductive and freedoms, for ensuring gender equality, including for our transgender and gender fluid persons to ensure quality and affordable health care and education for all people, for all people in the United States, for establishing just and equitable taxation policies and ensuring there is an economic safety net for our disadvantaged 
and historically marginalized citizens. For protecting lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asex plus rights, most especially protecting our transgender and gender fluid citizens who are so viciously under attack right now. There is still more legislation down the pike to dehumanize our friends and neighbors and family members, including the, they would have impact on some of the people in this congregation. Let's not forget. Confronting racial, religious, and ethnic exclusion and intolerance, which would also affect people in this congregation. It's not an outside, it's an inside. Establishing humane immigration, border and refugee policies, and principled international policies and alliances. Pursuing economic policies that increase opportunity and fairness and equality for all people in the United States. For addressing gun control and violent crime and police injustice and prison reform and finally and perhaps most importantly, what is at stake. Choosing a president and other leaders who possess the character qualities of decency. Let's start with decency, shall we? Do we have to actually just start there? But clearly we do. Compassion, generosity, service, thoughtfulness, reason, intelligence, and selflessness. Yeah, we like that selflessness thing, right? Rather than venality, ignorance, cruelty, narcissism, greed, anger, ignorance, and vindictiveness. We want decency and compassion and thoughtfulness and a sense of service. I truly don't know what to make of the people who are drawn to the narrow racist and fascist vision of the world. But I take it seriously when, I, when people say the quiet part out loud, because they've been saying it quietly for a long time, and feel they have permission to do so because of what is repeated again and again by people they're supposed to be looking up to. Remember that core element of fascism is that one repeats the lie until it becomes believed. Repeat the suspicion and projection until people don't know what to trust and give up wanting to try. As our ancestors did before in the great experiment of bringing a democratic process into this country, as our ancestors of so many lines have done before, we can instead persist and endure. What can at first, in this idea of democracy, what can at first be an intellectual experiment, everybody has a vote and a voice, goes to the very heart of our theology, that nexus of covenant and authority and the basic worth that people have been fighting for for ages. I am human, I am here, I have a place and a part and a voice. We are human, and our lives and our planet is worthy. Little did those Puritans know what seeds they planted when they gathered their early churches in resistance to oppression. Yeah, they really wouldn't know this world, but I'll just take the legacy in the meantime. 
the months leading up to this election have been already brutal on our emotional systems. I feel it this week in particular, as I think many do, given the last, the news of the last week for our Puerto Rican siblings. I feel it in every new story of a woman who died because they did not have access to life save to life saving health care because of the restrictions that have been put upon abortion access. I feel it every time a person calls for violence against people who speak up for values. So for this week, <coughs> excuse me, for this week to come, I invite us to take care, to take a breather if need, when needed from news and even social media, to have as simple as having an extra glass of water. I mean it. This is practical and spiritual counsel. We are science-based people. We understand body, mind, spirit. Drink the water. I have a resource. I think we have printed copies out in the foyer of things that can be a spiritual discipline. Uh, or just contemplation to help personal practice of adjusting and focusing and taking care of oneself. Join us on Wednesday evening to process, to decompress, just to simply be with others. Join us next Sunday for service. It will be revealed what next Sunday's service will be. Just keep that in mind. But we will. Afterwards, share soup and bread and good company. I think that might be plenty of message by itself. We will need it regardless. And so let me close. I so appreciate Dr. King and his constant reminder that there's so much to which we must be maladjusted. But he also pointed us to faith. He also pointed us to possibility. And he used a piece from one of our Unitarian forebears, the Reverend Theodore Parker, who offered in an 1853 sermon, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Regardless, for the final outcome of this particular election. And as we continue to work for a better and more humane United States and the world, we must believe that deep too in our hearts and with our help, with each of us lending a few stubborn human ounces to the fight, that the moral arc of the universe will indeed bend slowly toward justice and bend toward freedom, and bend toward equality, and bend toward compassion, and bend toward decency, bend toward inclusion, and bend toward love and respect for the entire human family and for our world. I finish this moment with equal measures of hope and fear. I know there are far more examples of peaceful, functional, compassionate moments such as I found in the Election Commission than otherwise. What happened in the Election Commission with my family is more typical. Right? That's what people usually want and usually do. I know as I think you also know, that this work of this week, whatever the result, is only entering a new phase after the election is determined. I am anticipating those long weeks until the ratification in January and beyond. 
This is a marathon, remember. This is for the long haul. Our task is to live our values, hold and strive for a more humane nation. Hold and strive for a world from which love can be more manifest, the love that holds us all. Indeed, indeed, the arc of the universe, we have our small part in making that bending possible. Let us go forth. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn number 297, Sing Out Praises for the Journey. Have a seat. Good morning. That was an excellent sermon. I don't think I've heard a better. I hope our final words will continue the issues so well presented to us. Love is the center of almost all things on earth. But today, its emphasis is on our beloved flame. As Eric Hepburn reminds us, in love remains the center. We extinguish this flame to remind us, love is the center. As we explore and rest, engage and heal, Love remains the center. When all we can see is cold ashes, love remains. Love to all of you. from my colleague, the Reverend Deborah Hafner. As we enter this week of uncertainty in the world, let us remember that there is only one side, that of humanity and planet Earth. 
May we pray for peace. May we raise our voices with our elected officials and engage as we can in acts of resistance. May we remember to take very good care of ourselves, each other, and those we love. And may we remember the words adapted from the unity prayer. The light of love surrounds us. Love enfolds us. The power of love protects us. Love watches over us. Wherever we are, love is. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>